please make sure you check out the latest episode of our podcast, Into the Killing. In this week's episode, we look at a notorious crime that rocked New Jersey and went unsolved for decades. In our next episode, we'll examine a cold case that was solved after decades and it turned out that the murderer was an infamous serial killer. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But before we get into today's video, we want to take a moment to talk about our fantastic sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is the best streaming service for documentaries, and they have a ton of great true crime documentaries. A documentary they recently added, which I thought was fascinating, is called Unsolved, The Story of the Cape Ripper. It's the true story of a serial killer who hunted sex workers in South Africa from 1992 to 1996. He claimed the lives of at least 26 women, and he was never caught. This is an unnerving documentary you won't soon forget. Magellan TV also has an incredible selection of history documentaries. Just earlier today, I watched one called Ivan the Terrible. I always knew that he was one of the most evil people who ever lived, because how else do you get a nickname like the Terrible? But this documentary painted a brutal picture of the former Russian Tsar. And I have great news if you're looking to get into Magellan TV. Criminally listed viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. That means you can get access to over 3,000 documentaries for just $3.50 a month. I've been watching Magellan TV for over a year now, and I can't emphasize how great of a deal that is. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. If you have been watching with me and you let your subscription lapse, you can still claim this offer. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting Criminally Listed. Number 3. Shirley Marie Curry In June 1955, 18-year-old Shirley Marie McBroom married 25-year-old Jimmy Lee Curry. Just over a year later, in October 1956, Shirley gave birth to a daughter, Sabrina Marie. This was followed by his son, Richard Allen, in December 1959. A third child, a son, Jesse Lee, was born in November 1963. The family lived in Springdale, Arkansas. Shirley and Jimmy's marriage didn't last. Twelve years after they wed, Shirley filed for divorce. She was awarded custody of their three children. But there was a special condition in the custody agreement. When the children turned 14, they would be allowed to choose if they wanted to live with their mother or their father. After divorcing Shirley, Jimmy remarried. In late 1970, when Sabrina turned 14, she chose to live with her father and stepmother. Just over three years later, on June 19th, 1974, there was a custody hearing regarding 14-year-old Richard. He had decided that he wanted to live with his father, stepmother, and his sister. That day after the hearing, Richard went back to his mother's home in Lowell, Arkansas. Just after midnight, 37-year-old Shirley picked up her 38 caliber revolver and she shot 14-year-old Richard who was sitting in front of the TV. Then she went into the bedroom of 11-year-old Jesse and shot him to death as well. She then sat down and talked into a tape recorder. She admitted to killing both of her sons and then she said that she planned on killing the rest of her family and several other people. She also wrote a note. Then Shirley Curry got into her pickup truck and drove over to her ex-husband's home in Springdale. When she got there, she rang the doorbell and 42-year-old Jimmy got out of bed and answered the door. Shirley shot her ex-husband multiple times in the doorway and then entered the home. She knocked on the door of 17-year-old Sabrina's bedroom. Sabrina asked who was there, and Shirley said it was her mother. Shirley then entered the room and shot her eldest child twice in the right temple. 
Jimmy's wife heard the gunshots and she ran from the house. She got a neighbor to call 911. After shooting her daughter, Shirley left and drove six blocks to the home of Jimmy's stepsister, 27-year-old Joanne Brophy. Shirley shot her multiple times as well. Afterwards, Shirley drove to nearby Farmington, Arkansas. She went to the home of her sister's ex-husband, 46-year-old James Dotson. She rang the doorbell and Dotson came to the door. When Dotson saw that Shirley had a gun, he slammed the door. Shirley fired two shots through the door and Dotson was hit in the face and the neck. Shirley then got back into her pickup truck and drove away. At this point, the police in the area were looking for Shirley. She was spotted as she drove into Fayetteville, Arkansas. She was pulled over and she surrendered without incident. James Dodson was rushed to the hospital. Out of the six people Shirley Curry shot that night, he was the only one who survived. Shirley's 42-year-old ex-husband, 17-year-old daughter, 14-year-old son, 11-year-old son, and 27-year-old ex-sister-in-law all succumbed to their wounds. After Shirley was arrested, the police found the note she had written earlier in her vehicle. It was clear that after Shirley finished her rampage, she planned on dying by suicide. Part of the note read, No one will ever come near me. The kids are afraid of me, so they say on the stand. I am nothing, never was, nor ever will be, so why fight? I quit. Nothing is worth it now. After the murders, Shirley was committed to a psychiatric hospital. Four years later, in July 1978, a doctor determined that Shirley had gone over her mental illness. So she stood trial for the murders. She pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial ended in a hung jury. Shirley went to trial again, and this time she was found guilty. She was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Shirley Curry died in prison in 2015, 41 years after her deadly rampage. She was 79 years old. Number 2. Kelly Silk Kelly Mullen was born in East Hartford, Connecticut in July 1967. Tragically, when Kelly was 7 years old, her mother died by suicide. Her father, who worked as a pipe fitter, never remarried, and he raised Kelly and her two siblings on his own. In December 1995, Kelly married Charles Silk in a civil ceremony. They had met at a singles meeting. At the time, Kelly was a single mother of a daughter named Jessica. When Kelly and Charles got married, Jessica was about five years old. Kelly grew up as a Catholic, and Charles was a member of a Baptist church that preaches a literal interpretation of the Bible. Kelly eventually became a member of the church. The couple regularly donated their time and money to the church. On Sundays, Kelly would make dinner for the elderly members of the church. The family always attended church services. In July 1996, Kelly gave birth to a daughter, Jennifer. Many people thought that Kelly was a great mother who doted on her children. But not everyone was convinced that things were going well with the family. Charles's mother thought that Kelly was dangerously depressed. Someone on her behalf called the Department of Children and Families. As a result of the call, caseworkers talked to Kelly. 
She said she had experienced depression in the past, but it was no longer a problem. The caseworkers ultimately closed the file on the family. In January 1998, Kelly gave birth to a son, Jonah. About five months later, an ambulance came to the family's home because Kelly attempted suicide by overdosing on Prozac. After attempting to take her own life, Kelly talked to the assistant pastor at her church. The church didn't like traditional mental therapy, especially the use of medication. Instead, they used biblical teachings for counseling. After Kelly's suicide attempt, the assistant pastor started counseling her. In the spring of 1999, Kelly gave birth to a son. Like her other three children, this son was bestowed with a name that started with the letter J, Joshua. Things took a turn for the worse after Joshua was born. Kelly told several people that she was depressed. She stopped making Sunday meals for the elderly. In June 1999, the family was living on a quiet cul-de-sac in East Hartford, Connecticut. Charles was working as a cutter operator and inventory supervisor at an offset printing company. With children who were 9, 2, 1, and 2 months old, Kelly was a full-time mother. Just after midnight on June 10, 1999, it's believed that Joshua wouldn't stop crying and 32-year-old Kelly snapped. She choked Joshua and then dropped him back into his crib. Kelly then picked up a kitchen knife. She went into the master bedroom where her 39-year-old husband was sleeping and stabbed him multiple times. The sounds of the attack woke up 9-year-old Jessica who went to investigate the disturbance. She saw her mother stabbing her stepfather. Then Kelly attacked her daughter. Jessica was stabbed and slashed 61 times. When Kelly was finished with her eldest daughter, she grabbed a gas can, which the family used to fill the lawnmower. She then went back into the bedroom and poured gas on her daughter. She then doused herself in gasoline. Then she lit a match. There was a flash fire and Kelly asphyxiated to death. The fire spread to the rest of the second story of the home. Somehow, even though Jessica was bleeding profusely and she was on fire, she made it out of the house. Neighbors had her roll around on the ground until the fire was put out. First responders arrived and she was rushed to the hospital. Two-month-old Joshua was also found alive in the house. He was rushed to the hospital with smoke inhalation, burns, and bruises on his neck. Sadly, it was too late for two-year-old Jennifer and one-year-old Jonah. They both died from smoke inhalation. Also, Charles did not survive the assault. Jessica and Joshua were in critical condition for days but they ultimately survived. After the horrible tragedy, many people struggled to find a reason for Kelly's actions. What is known is that Kelly was always haunted by her mother's death and she wondered why she did it. Kelly also wondered why her mother didn't kill her as well. Kelly also had been suffering from depression for years. Things may have got worse with postpartum depression, which led to a breaking point. But we'll probably never know exactly what was going through Kelly Silk's mind on that fateful night. Number 1. Patricia Colombo On May 7, 1976, the police in Chicago, Illinois were called because a car had been abandoned on the west side of the city. The police checked out the car and noted that the car's radio had been stolen. 
The police learned that the owner of the car was Frank Colombo, who lived in Elk Grove Village, which is about 20 miles southwest of Chicago. They tried to call Frank several times, but got no response. Officers went to his home that afternoon. When they pulled up front, they instantly noticed that something was off. There were three days of newspaper on their front porch. Also, the front door was open. As an officer approached the door, he heard a dog whining. So he called for more backup. When officers entered the home, they instantly noticed that it was abnormally warm and an awful scent lingered in the air. They found the decaying body of a man in the living room. In the upstairs hallway, they found the body of a woman. Her nightshirt had been pulled up and her underwear had been pulled down. In a bedroom, they found the dead body of an adolescent boy. It was clear he had been stabbed dozens of times. He had also been shot and beaten in the head. In his bedroom, on an open page of a yearbook, was a bloody pair of scissors. Also close to his body was a bloody bowling trophy. It did not take long before the police identified the bodies. They were 43-year-old Frank Colombo, his 41-year-old wife, Mary, and their 13-year-old son, Michael. The medical examiner believed that the family had been dead for days. After the murders, the killer or killers turned up the heat in the hopes of speeding up decay. Autopsies were performed and it revealed that Frank had been shot four times in the head. His head also had wounds for blunt force trauma. It appeared that he had been hit with a lamp and the bowling trophy. Only small pieces of the lamp were found in the living room. He had also been stabbed and slashed in the neck. His neck had been burned, possibly with a lit cigarette. Mary had been shot once between the eyes and she was also beaten with the trophy and stabbed in the neck. Although it looked like she had been sexually assaulted, there were no physical signs that she had been raped. Like his mother, Michael had been shot once in the head. Like his parents, he had been beaten with the bowling trophy. In total, he had been stabbed 84 times. Eight stabs were deep and most likely done with the scissors that were found near his body. The other wounds were shallow stabs or cuts that could have been made with the scissors or another sharp instrument. One gun was used in the murder. It was a 32 caliber. The police determined that the family was killed three nights earlier. That night, they had eaten at a local restaurant, and the food they ate was still in their stomachs when they were autopsied. Mary Colombo was a homemaker, and Frank Colombo was a manager for an auto parts supplier. He managed one of their warehouses. It turned out that not all of Frank's dealings were on the level. Also, in Frank's address book were the names and contact information of several people who were well-known members of organized crime syndicates. So the police thought that the murders may have been connected to Frank's business dealings. But suspicion soon fell on the only surviving member of the Colombo family, 19-year-old Patricia Colombo. Patricia did not live with her family. Instead, she lived in an apartment with her fiancé, 39-year-old Frank DeLuca. DeLuca was a pharmacist and the manager of a Walgreens. The police first suspected Patricia because of her odd behavior after the murders. One of DeLuca's employees heard about the murders and he told DeLuca. DeLuca supposedly went to the apartment that he shared with Patricia and told her that her family had been slaughtered. They stayed home for several hours and then she and DeLuca went to the police station that night. At the police station, Patricia was calm and didn't show much emotion. 
The police then began to investigate Patricia and her fiancé, Frank DeLuca. Patricia and DeLuca met in May 1972, a month shy of Patricia's 16th birthday. She was a waitress at a diner next door to the Walgreens that DeLuca managed. When they met, DeLuca was married and he had five children with his wife. Patricia and DeLuca's relationship turned sexual a few months after they met. DeLuca considered himself to be a swinger and he had Patricia sleep with other men. Sometimes he would join in. In June 1974, when Patricia was 17, DeLuca convinced his wife to let Patricia move into their home, saying that she was having problems at her home. That living arrangement lasted nearly a year, and then Patricia told her father that she wanted to move out of DeLuca's home. Her father, who did not like DeLuca, agreed to pay rent for her apartment. In May 1975, Patricia moved into her own apartment. But not long after Patricia moved out, DeLuca came to her and told her that he was leaving his family and he wanted to be with her. DeLuca moved into Patricia's apartment not long afterward. When Frank Colombo found out that DeLuca was living with his daughter in an apartment that he was paying for, he became enraged. In July 1975, ten months before the murder, he took his rifle and found DeLuca as he was leaving the pharmacy for the night. Frank hit DeLuca in the mouth with the butt of his rifle. He told him to stay away from his daughter or he would kill him. Frank's blow knocked out one of DeLuca's teeth and loosened three others. DeLuca ended up undergoing dental surgery. The police talked to a friend of Patricia's. She said that Patricia had hired two men to kill her parents. The police tracked down the two men. The men said that Patricia offered them sex and money in exchange for killing her parents. She told the two men that she would go to her family's home and leave a door unlocked so they could get inside. She drew up floor plans of the house and gave them to one of the men. The man kept the drawing and handed it over to the police. For several months, the two men strung Patricia along. They always had an excuse as to why they couldn't commit the murders. For example, initially Patricia didn't want her brother killed. So they told her they couldn't do it when her brother Michael was home. Patricia then changed her mind and told them to kill her brother as well. While the two men didn't go through with the contract hits, one of them admitted that he gave Patricia a gun. It was a 32 caliber handgun, which is the caliber of gun used in the murders. The police talked to two of DeLuca's friends. Both of them said that DeLuca confessed to them that he shot the family. They also said that DeLuca said that he beat Frank Colombo with a lamp. Notably, DeLuca never mentioned stabbing any of the family members or beating any of them with a bowling trophy. DeLuca's friends knew details about the murders that were never made public. One of the friends said they came into the Walgreens the morning after the murders. He found DeLuca in the back using the incinerator. Lucas said he was burning his bloody clothes. Ten days after the bodies were found, Patricia and DeLuca were arrested. They both denied committing the murders. But sometime after she was arrested, Patricia was talking to two police officers. She said she had a vision of the crime scene. She then went on to describe the crime scene fairly accurately. This further convinced the police that she was involved in the murder. Patricia Colombo and Frank DeLuca were tried together. Their trial started in May 1978 and it lasted six weeks. 
The prosecution argued that Patricia and DeLuca committed the murders together. They did it because they didn't want Patricia's father interfering in their relationship. They also wanted the inheritance. What the couple didn't know was that Frank had written Patricia out of the family will months earlier. The prosecution did not have much physical evidence. Notably, the gun has never been found. The most substantial evidence was blood smears found on the trunk of Frank Colombo's car. They were made with a gloved hand. An expert said it was a person's left hand and that person was missing their index finger on that hand. Frank DeLuca happened to be missing the index finger on his left hand. The prosecution's case was mostly testimony of people who knew the couple. Several people testified that Patricia wanted her family dead. This included two men she tried to hire to kill them. During the trial, Frank DeLuca testified. He said that everyone who testified against him was lying. He did admit that Patricia tried to get the two men to kill Frank Colombo, but he had called off the hit. The biggest problem for the prosecution was proving that Patricia had taken part in the actual murders. They had enough evidence to prove conspiracy to commit murder, but they weren't sure if they had enough evidence to prove that Patricia took part in the actual murders or was even in the house when the murders were committed. But they argued circumstantial evidence placed her there. The prosecution pointed out that there was no forced entry or break-in. It's highly doubtful that Frank Colombo would have let DeLuca into his home. According to the prosecutor's theory, Patricia knocked on the door while DeLuca was hiding. Frank opened the door and let his daughter in and he walked back into the living room. DeLuca quickly followed Patricia into the house. He shot Frank twice, then he shot Mary, and finally he shot Michael. He went out to the living room and noticed Frank wasn't dead. So he beat him with a lamp, which broke. He then shot him twice more in the head. After DeLuca shot each victim, the prosecutor alleged that Patricia followed behind him and beat the victims with a bowling trophy. She also stabbed her brother. They argued this because when Frank confessed to his friends, he admitted shooting the family members, but he didn't say anything about beating them with the trophy or stabbing them with the scissors. That's because he didn't commit those acts. Instead, Patricia did. The prosecutor also said that two people could have stabbed Michael. He pointed out the differences in the stab wounds on Michael's body. Eight of the stab wounds were very deep and a lot of force was used. The other wounds were shallow or just cuts. Therefore, it's possible that two people with varying degrees of strength did the stabbing. Then Patricia or DeLuca or both used pieces of the broken lamp to cut the throats of Frank and Mary. Then the broken lamp pieces were gathered up and they were taken from the crime scene. It's believed that after the murders, the killer stole Frank Colombo's car. If that's true, then how did the killer get to the Colombo's home? There's no record of a taxi dropping anyone off in the area. Also, no one saw a mysterious person walking around the area before the murders. It's highly possible that an accomplice drove the killer there, or two people took part in the murders. After the murders, one drove away in the vehicle that they brought to the crime scene and the other took Frank Colombo's car. In the ashtray of Frank's car, there was a unique brand of cigarette. Patricia just happened to smoke that brand. Finally, Patricia told one of the hitmen that she wanted to be there when her family was killed to see that they got what they deserved. 
The trial lasted for six weeks and then the jury deliberated for two hours. They found both Patricia Colombo and Frank DeLuca guilty on all charges. They were both sentenced to 200 to 300 years of prison. Even in prison, Patricia Colombo continued to make headlines. In September 1977, it was reported that Patricia had been involved in lurid and illegal behavior in prison. She had been procuring women to have group sex with prison officials. In the end, Patricia didn't face any legal consequences over the sex parties. The only major fallout was that the warden ended up resigning. In 1984, Patricia applied for parole for the first time and she was denied. She was denied parole for a second time a few years later. In early 1988, shortly before her third parole hearing, Patricia took responsibility for the murders in a public statement. She said that her actions directly led to the murder of her family. But the parole board noted that she didn't mention that she was remorseful. Patricia had a parole hearing days later and she was denied parole for the third time. At the time of this video, Patricia Colombo has applied for parole over 15 times. She has been denied each time. Currently, 64-year-old Patricia Colombo is serving her sentence at the Logan Correctional Center in Lincoln, Illinois. Frank DeLuca has also applied for parole several times and he has been denied each time. At the time of this recording, Frank DeLuca is 82 years old and he is incarcerated at the Dixon Correctional Center in Dixon, Illinois. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our podcast, Into the Killing. It can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.